I'm so problem. sorry about last time. We're back. I was just telling everybody about how my phone overheated. Oh, good. <laughs> we had to end. So um, we were, um, Dr. Hareton is back with us. He's a reproductive endocrinologist um, here uh, in Oakland. Um, also sees patients in San Ramon in the Bay Area. And I'll have him talk uh, just at the end about, you know, how you can work with him if you are someone's watching this and you're like, oh, I'd like to go see him for a consult or for IVF. Um, and I was just telling everybody kind of the three ways that we were talking about before and how, you know, one can get pregnant, either spontaneous or IUI, IVF, or the third party using donor egg, donor sperm, or even a surrogate. So we were just kind of recapping okay. that. Um, and then we were sort of ending, <clears throat> we were really getting into the meat of our conversation was this whole concept of IVF. And um, we were, I was asking you uh, at that point, um, you know, if we can yeah. go, go through the whole like process, a lot of patients ask me, how long is it going to take? What kinds of hormones do I have to, you know, inject into my body? Um, how many weeks is this whole process? So we'd love to hear from you um, what that looks like. Um, and yeah, thank you it. again. No and welcome back. So let's go back to IVF. So I think when we got disconnected, we were talking about what the process looks like. And I always like to start by explaining what we're trying to do. So every month, women that have regular cycles have small follicles called antral follicles in the ovary. And it could be 5, 10, 15, 20. What we're trying to do with IVF is we're trying to get them all to grow. In a regular month, your brain makes FSH or follicle-stimulating hormone. Out of however many follicles you have available, one of them will start to grow, and that's a follicle that you ovulate. So that's why you usually ovulate one egg, sometimes two at a time. What we do in IVF is we take the brain of the equation for the month and we give you injections of FSH. So same kind of hormone, higher doses. We make all those little eggs feel special and start to grow. So we might get 10, we might get 15, we might get 20. It depends on the ovarian reserve, but we're trying to get them to all grow and we're trying to get them to grow together to the point where they're about the same size that you would be ovulating in your own body and then we give you a different injection to have those eggs get ready to ovulate. If we did nothing at all, we gave you that trigger injection, that's what we call it, then we, you would just ovulate all those 5, 10, 20 eggs. But what we do is that in a very precise time window, typically around 36 hours later, we go in and we do something called an egg retrieval. So an egg retrieval is a procedure that we do in our uh, ambulatory surgery center it takes somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes to get the eggs out. We, we do it, and most people do it under light anesthesia. So this is anesthesia uh, that goes through an IV, uh, similar to what patients would get for a colonoscopy. So they will feel like they had a long nap. They won't feel any pain. They won't remember the procedure. And what we're doing is that we're going in, we're putting a needle through the vagina into each ovary, and we're aspirating all of that fluid. Uh, that fluid is connected to little test tubes. Those test tubes go straight into the embryology lab, and we're trying to empty that fluid to get all of those eggs out. Uh, the patient then wakes up, hangs out with us for 30, 60 minutes, make sure they feel well. I always like to check up on them. I let them know how many eggs we got, uh, and then they go home. In the embryology lab, then we go, we find, the, you know, we find those eggs, we clean them up, we inseminate them uh, or freeze them. So if a patient's doing egg freezing to preserve future fertility, we will freeze those eggs that day. But if they want to do fertility treatment, we will inseminate them. And then the next morning we check, we see how many eggs were fertilized and we grow them as embryos. So that's kind of what the process looks like. The average person usually has about one to two weeks of pills that they take before. The goal of taking pills, which is either estrogen or a birth control pill, which has estrogen and progesterone, is to make sure that no follicle starts growing too early. We want to keep those follicles small at the beginning so that they all start the race at the same time. Otherwise, what we sometimes end up with is some people get to the finish line early and they're ready, you know, day eight, day nine, other ones still need a couple of days. So then we're struggling trying to you know, figure out how do we get the most number of follicles in that ideal range. We don't want them to get too big because we might lose that egg. They often get post-mature. We don't want them to be too small because they're sometimes immature. 
So we want to get them in that optimal window. And because we give the pills at the beginning, that helps hopefully keep all of those eggs at bay and those follicles from growing. The injection part takes usually about 11 days on average, sometimes nine, sometimes 13. We don't really, you know, kind of go with a preset formula. Patients can expect to come in sporadically at the beginning every three, four days, maybe every other day at the middle and sometimes even every day at the end because we really want to fine tune that trigger day to the optimal time. We work weekends, we work holidays, we work, you know, literally the whole year. Luckily, we have a big group and we all rotate taking that weekend call, but we don't want to, you know, avoid a weekend and give you a worse response. We want to really pick the optimal day for you. And then after that, like I mentioned, it's about five to six days to grow those embryos. And then at that point, we can either do a transfer if we're transferring fresh. And most often what we do is we freeze those embryos and send it over to genetic testing, um, which allows us to figure out, do these embryos have the right number of chromosomes? Uh, once we find that healthy embryo with the right number of chromosomes, the pregnancy rate is about 65%, so it's really good. Um, and then if they don't have the right number of chromosomes, we know it wouldn't have resulted in a healthy pregnancy. So then we end up uh, not transferring those embryos and either transferring one of the other ones or starting from the beginning. So that was a lot of information pretty quick. So happy to kind of break that down or dive in wherever you want. Great. Okay. So it sounds like it's about a two week really intense period. Um, of the monitoring and the injections, and maybe there's some medication before, but it's really like for a lot of women are working and they, they're like, oh, you know, what, what's the time frame that I really need to be focused on? So it sounds like it's about two yeah, weeks. Yeah, it's and about then, two course, weeks. What I tell my, you know, I'd Correct. say it's about two weeks. Yeah. I tell my patients, pick a window of time where you're going to be around for like two and a half, three weeks, because it's never super exact. And I don't want you to be stressed that, like, hey, the, the cycle's taking longer, yeah. but you have a trip to Italy or a work trip that you can miss, et cetera. I take care of a lot of like yeah. CEOs that yeah. are, you know, they have a board meeting, they can't miss it, which is understandable. So I say, you know, maybe we should do this on the other side. Because I also want them to go through this experience with, you know, the right mindset. A month here and there doesn't really matter. So we do a lot of tinkering around with their cycles and working to make that fall in the right window. Other things to kind of think about most patients feel a little bit bloated, um, a little bit more tired than usual, and a little bit more emotional than usual. So, you know, not the best time to have a high stress mm -hmm. situation. Uh, a lot of people deal with stress by exercising and get that kind of runner's high or exercise high. Mm -hmm. As your ovaries start mm -hmm. to get larger, we're going to tell you to kind of lay off the exercise a little bit. It's okay to get on the peloton if you're in the saddle. It's okay to do a little yoga. But we, what I really don't want you to do is bounce around, go running, go playing contact sports when you're pivoting because the ovaries get larger and they can twist on their blood supply. Uh, it's really rare that that happens. Yes. But if that happens, it's really painful. And it's a surgical emergency called ovarian torsion, which I know you're probably very familiar with. So we try to let people from yeah. about the beginning, the middle of the yeah. stimulation until they get a period for about two weeks we have people not exercise heavily. It's okay to sweat, but not, not with bouncing. So we end up uh, doing a little bit less uh, awesome. exercise there. So we're taking away your coping mechanism. Not a great time to drink heavily. Uh, obviously no drugs during this process. So we really wanna want people focused and, and we work around the schedules to do that. For the, you know, I take care of a lot of physicians as well that have full schedules. We start monitoring pretty early, around seven in the morning. So I have a lot of patients that come in, take the first appointment, and they're out the door at seven fifteen, seven twenty, and at work by eight. So uh, we certainly work with uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. that have schedule limitations, but there needs to be a little bit of flexibility. And it is important to know as we get closer to the retrieval, we can ballpark and say it looks like you know you might be triggering, you know, two days Tuesday. So let's. It looks like you might be triggering. Thursday or Friday, which means a Saturday or Sunday retrieval. So we can give you some visibility, but we don't really know for sure until about like 2, 3 p.m., two days prior to your retrieval. 
So it's important to know that you're not going to get a ton of notice. You need someone, you need your partner to come with you to give us a sperm sample unless they throw sperm. And if you're doing this on your own or you're egg freezing, you need someone to pick you up because you will have had anesthesia. You can't drive back home. So those are kind of big picture things to consider that are not so much clinical, but more, you know, kind of lifestyle, which, which is very important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned those. Now, when it comes to um, sperm, you mentioned um, either your partner needs to be there to give fresh sperm on the day of, uh, you know, egg retrieval, or is it pretty common that people are you know, also freezing it's sperm? Not that common. And, you know, I will say, there are some okay. patients where I'm worried about the production on the day off where the sperm has been low and I will ask them to fr freeze mm -hmm. a vial before to have us back up. I like to use fresh sperm. You know, we, we do quite well with frozen as well, but nothing like something that would produce right on time on that day. So what I do with my patients is I say, you know, most people don't need it. People that have sperm factor, we do something called intracytoplasmic sperm injection where we take one sperm that looks good and we inject it right into the egg. So someone has 15 eggs, we need 15 sperm. We don't really need more than that. And even, even in people that have lower counts, that is often not that difficult to find. But if we're worried about the production, then I'll freeze a vial of sperm, I'll have it as backup and I'll tell my lab, I still want that guy to come give us a sperm sample. Uh, and if it looks good, we use that one. And if not, we have sperm. Uh, backed up uh, that we can thaw that day so there that's usually what backed what up. i do okay 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 great and you you said the interest cytos, uh, cytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI is what we call it so that is um in contrast to just letting uh sperm and egg just kind of Correct. meet on their own um is to, today in 2023 is it kind of 50 50 or or is one method of, you know, fertilization so I would more, say, more common? Uh, you know, ICSI was invented in the early 2000s and it really helped us take care of a lot of male factor infertility. It increases fertilization rates for people with male factor significantly. For people that don't have a male factor where everything looks normal, we don't know that it increases the fertilization rate. Uh, but sometimes you find out you had a male factor that you didn't know about because it didn't fertilize. So I'd say... Uh, most people are leaning more mm. towards more ICSI than not. Uh, it's probably very clinic dependent. I'd say some clinics are 50-50 or 60-40 and some clinics are 100% ICSI because that just works very well. Um, okay. I'd say in my practice, I probably yeah. do like 80% ICSI. Mm -hmm. So if someone's really has a perfect semen analysis, I talk okay. about the options and some people lean one way, some people lean the other. Um, and then if people have um, no sperm factor at all or, or have like any sort of like abnormality, like low morphology, low motility, then I usually just recommend ICSI because it's, it's what we would do if it doesn't work well the first time, but people are spending a lot of money and a lot of time and effort. So I'd rather not find out afterwards. I'd rather, you know, get it right the first time. So that's why we end up leaning towards a lot more ICSI than we did before. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, you also mentioned genetic testing. So once the um, embryo is made, the sperm and the egg meet, you've got some embryos. You mentioned, you know, getting it tested for chromosomal analysis. I know when I was doing my residency, this was mm -hmm. just sort of like coming out and then, you know, it was kind of optional. Um, what, what do you recommend today? What is the practice today? Um, do you recommend that all these embryos get tested prior to freezing them or prior to implantation mm -hmm. obviously if it's a fresh That's cycle right. you really can't test correct so so what is so what we're is doing a lot, lot more that? frozen cycles i'd say we probably do 90 plus percent frozen cycles because it allows us to stimulate people more without risking hyperstimulation. and so we're already freezing mm -hmm. a lot of these embryos mm -hmm. with or without mm -hmm. testing i would say it depends on the age on how strongly we recommend genetic testing I'd say for someone who's like 37, 38 or above, we usually do because that's about when half and half of your embryos are expected to be normal or abnormal. When we get these uh, embryos, they might look really good under the microscope, but when you transfer them, they're either going to lead to no pregnancy or a miscarriage if they're abnormal. 
So we'd like to find out before to save you the time, the money, the heartbreak, uh, and, and you know, the emotional pain that getting excited about it and going through it and not getting pregnant leads to. So that's one. Then when we, um, when we think about the younger patients, I'd say I usually leave it up to them. It's certainly not necessary, but I'm finding at least in the Bay Area, the majority of patients do end up wanting to do it. Uh, even if it's 30% of the embryos might be abnormal, they want to know ahead of time. A lot of my younger patients are planning for a larger family. So they're not just planning for baby number one, but also for baby number two, baby number three, and they want to know what they have in the freezer. So they want to know, they want to do all of their cycles now because they, they know it's going to be the best outcome possible. So when we freeze and we have five embryos, I don't know if mm -hmm. that's five normal ones, which will make me re feel really good for the next two babies, or that's like five, and that could be two normal ones. So we have a very low margin of error. We won't really find out until we transfer all of them. So genetic testing doesn't make our chances better mm -hmm. as a whole, because always it's going to be the same or better if we transfer all the embryos, but it will help us identify the ones that won't work as well. Uh, and in that scenario, um, you know, I, I think it's a good idea. And then the last reason why people do genetic testing that I think is also quite popular is you can find out the gender of the embryos before you transfer. So for some people that doesn't matter at all and we keep it a surprise mm -hmm. and exciting the, the old fashioned way. But for a lot of people, they do want to know or they have a, a couple of kids of a given gender and want to have the other one. So they come just for that. So we're able to give them the opportunity to, to pick if they have a preference or not pick if they don't. Okay, perfect. Um, now you mentioned that during IVF and the hormonal injections, some uh, women can feel bloated, some mood changes, fatigued. Um, we also talked about torsion. Um, can you just say a word about like ovarian hyperstimulation and how often you really see that? You know, we practice? used to see it a lot more uh, when we were doing HCG triggers, which is one type of trigger that we use. But recently, we've developed Lupron triggers, which are triggers that have a much shorter half-life. So it comes on, it gives us a very similar response, eh, and then that goes away much quicker. We also got much better at freezing. So back in the day, there was nothing we could do. We just had to transfer them because we couldn't freeze the embryos. Now we can freeze them, we can keep them frozen. So between not doing transfers in patients that have high responders, and then not a eh, not using HCG for trigger, we have done much, much better. So I'd say the risk of hyperstimulation is quite low uh, in some patients with a very high reserve or PCOS. We still worry a little bit, but we tailor our approach and, and how we do this to, to account for that. Um, but yeah, ultimately I would say it is, uh, it is the exception these days mm -hmm. and it's rare. You know, you might feel extra bloated and uncomfortable, but it's yeah. rare that somebody ends up in the hospital uh, with hyperstimulation. Yeah. Yeah, got it. All right. Now, I know one of the things that patients are often wondering about mm -hmm. or asking about is the cost of IVF. Um, I know here in the Bay Area now, a lot of my patients are uh, in tech and a lot of these services are covered. I see patients even, you know, they're just getting egg freezing because they're mm -hmm. like, hey, I have the benefit. Why not? You know, they're not even really seriously thinking about a family at this moment. But um, what are you seeing in terms of overall coverage for these services with insurance um, and, and things like that? Yeah, so we're certainly like, we're seeing an that. increase in people that have covered cycles. So increased benefits. Uh, I would say that's a it's not the majority of patients yet, but I hope they are. There's a California bill in the Senate looking at this. There's mm -hmm. mandated states like Illinois or Massachusetts where everybody who works for a, you know, employer of a given size gets access to this. And I think that's how it should be. You know, I don't think people should really have to like mm -hmm. mortgage their house or choose between, you know, a vacation and having children because it's not really something that you choose. It's a medical condition and we can avoid it, but we're not there yet. I'm hoping we get there. The other trend we're seeing is we're seeing because this is something that people really want and it's very expensive, we're seeing more and more companies covering it as a benefit. So it started with Facebook, Google, Apple, and it's kind That's of expanded great. to a lot yeah. more companies covering it. They do it because they want to retain their 
employees yeah. and they want to help them build their families. Uh, and it's usually not gone to traditional insurance, but through a separate uh, benefit manager. So um, th we're seeing a little bit more of that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a great service. It's great for patients. It allows them to pick the right treatment for them and not just the one that's less expensive or, or might be affordable. And um, yeah. hopefully it continues to expand to more because we still have a lot of people that really need our help and can't afford it. Yeah. Ah, no, I, I definitely agree. And hopefully more of these programs are in the pipeline and we can see more patients getting covered and building their families as time goes on. Um, I know I see that, see that it is definitely challenging. I mean, mm -hmm. as you know, I take care of a lot of women with fibroids and it is definitely very heartbreaking. And um, that sometimes the number of cycles that they have to go through to yeah. just get that one baby. So um, awesome. Um, well, I think those are all my questions about IVF. Um, is there anything you wanted to mention that we haven't talked yeah, about, I, about I mean, IVF? I, oh, yeah. Um, tell me, tell me. Oh, you know what? Let me. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask you. Um, somebody mentioned to me, oh, um, a mm -hmm. mini IVF cycle. So can you comment on that? Is, is that? Um, What's the thing? It uh, depends who you ask. Uh, and it depends IVF. on the clinic. So mini IVF okay. cycles are cycles where rather than giving you the, the maximum dose of gonadotropins, uh, which are the FSH medication that helps stimulate the ovaries. You start with clomid or letrozole, and then you give lower doses, and it's kind of more of a gentle stimulation. So on average, you know, you do this for patients that have lower yeah. reserve. On average, you get less eggs, uh, and that might be enough. So it's, we don't have great data that giving a lot of medications or a little medication to a patient that doesn't have a lot of eggs will make a ton of difference. We try more because we're already doing it and the medications yeah. are not cheap, but they're certainly not the most expensive part of the process. So we try to stimulate as much, but mini IVF is a concept where you say we do less medications, less monitoring, and then hopefully for a lower price, we accept a little bit less eggs on average, but that tends to make it affordable for some. You know, There are people that you know, kind of call it low cost IVF, it's definitely cheaper if you give less meds and less ultrasounds and have less eggs to culture and biopsy, but it's also not necessarily good for everybody. Because you, you know, one of the things that I was going to say is like, not every, you know, people think they come to IVF and they go through it and boom, they have a baby the first time. And the average patient does about two to three cycles to get to a baby. You know, the older you are or the lower you reserve, the more cycles you're going to need because it's a numbers game. You know, the first, you know, it's the more eggs you get, the better because you're, you're throwing darts at the wall, trying to hit the bullseye and the more darts you throw, the better. So, it, you know, what we do is we maximize your opportunity by growing as many eggs as possible. And that's the concept of the darts. And we're more accurate hitting that bullseye the younger we are. So if you're coming in with a low reserve or you're coming in a little bit later in life, it will likely take more than one cycle and it's important to be prepared for that. So some of these patients say, well, if I'm going to need to do two cycles, I'm going to do mini IVF. And that might be, you know, 30% cheaper, but if you're going to get half as many eggs, you could do two of those and still pay more on a per egg basis. So it's important to be with a doctor you trust. It's important to be really forthcoming with your goals. I always ask my patients at the first visit, like, Tell me about the family that you imagine. How many kids do you want to have? What's your optimal? What would be okay? I make sure the expectations are set. I make sure we talk about this might take multiple cycles because, you know, it often doesn't take one. So I want to make sure that they know coming into the first, like, hey, we thought it was going to take three and we have an amazing cycle. I just had a patient that last week had a, you know, very low AMH. Uh, she was young. They told her she would never be able to get pregnant. She did one cycle, got two normal embryos from that cycle, which was incredible, right? So it happens, but on average, we might get one. Sometimes we get none. We do another one. So it's important to really align those expectations yeah. early on. Yeah, that's a really great point that just because you do IVF doesn't mean you're going to walk away with a baby after that one cycle. And I love that you said, yeah, it's a numbers game. And the earlier we start, the better. Um, that's something that I'm always also counseling patients. You know, I, I cringe a little bit when people, you know, come in at like 42 and ask them, hey, are you planning a pregnancy or do you have a kid? They're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to think about it sometime, you know, in a couple of years. And 
I'm like, all right, time's, time's ticking. As, as you said, the, the fertility also drops off around 30, 37 yeah. pretty, pretty sharply. So if this is something that, you know, you're thinking about the earlier, the better, the more planning you do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Time flies. And before you know it, you know, uh, sometimes you're working a lot harder to get those. That's embryos. Right. Yeah. So um, awesome. So, yeah, well, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Well, you can, can message me here you? and I'll get you hooked up with our clinic to make an appointment with, I don't do kind of medical advice or Instagram because my lawyer said that's a bad idea, but I'm more than happy to see anybody in <laughs> clinic and, and kind of go through this. I, I think it's important to get education. So even if you're not ready for treatment, knowing and understanding what your hormones are saying, you know, people find out that they're low when they didn't expect it. Healthy people have low reserves. So really important to get information. You can do it through me. You can do it through things like modern fertility or or different hormone testings. Uh, and that's a company that I advise and, and I think it's really good for women. And so for me in clinic, you can find me at RSC, Google it, find me online, make an appointment. We also offer fertility checks for women that just kind of want to check what's going on. So we'll check AMH, FSH and estrogen. And then one of our doctors will give you a call when those results are in, spend five or 10 minutes on the phone explaining those to you. And then a lot of patients are like, great, I just wanted to make sure I was okay. Some patients say, oh, wow, I'm surprised. Or I've been trying for a year. We find a lot of people exactly what you said. I've been trying for a year. I didn't realize I had to see a doctor uh, and, and we help them get the care. So mm -hmm. happy to help anybody. And, and thanks for having me on today. Thank you so much for coming um, twice and, and going through the process of IVF. I know this is something that a lot of patients ask about and um, you guys heard it. Dr. Hareton is seeing patients here in Oakland and uh, San Ramon as well. So you can find him at the Reproductive Science Center website. I'll put that information below. Um, so whether you are sure you want IVF and you want to go down that route or you're just curious about you know what your chances are and what all of that looks like, um, definitely reach out and um, please leave a comment if you have any other questions Absolutely. and we'll try to get back to you. No worries. Thank nice. you so much for uh, joining me today and Likewise. have a great so nice rest to see of the you. Day. Take care. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.